Hello, this video covers a brief introduction to green yard reactions and an experimental reaction between a green yard reagent and a chiral ketone. In this experiment, we will synthesize stereoisomers of 1-phenyl-3-methylcyclohexanol from 3-methylcyclohexanol and phenylmagnesium bromide. Here, phenylmagnesium bromide is the green yard reagent or namely organomagnesium reagent, and it will be made from a direct combination of magnesium metal and bromobenzene. On this slide, I'll introduce the Grignard reagents. Grignard reagents were discovered by the French chemist Victor Grignard, who was awarded the 1912 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for that groundbreaking work. The chemistry behind this reaction he brought to the light was quite revolutionary. A Grignard reagent is formed by the reaction of magnesium metal with an organic halide in ether solvents. The halide can be iodine, bromine, or chlorine. To the left of the reaction, R, representing an alkyl or aryl group, has a partial positive charge, and X, representing the halogen, bears a partial negative charge. When the reaction takes place, the magnesium inserts into the carbon-halogen bond. Thus, we get the product Grignard reagent on the right side of the reaction. In the Grignard reagents, the bond between carbon and magnesium is highly polarized in the opposite direction towards carbon, making carbon a nucleophilic center and leading it to gain considerable carbonyl character. This polarity results from the electronegativity difference between magnesium and carbon atoms. As can be seen from the periodic table, the carbon atom has an electronegativity value of 2.55, while magnesium, one of the group 2 alkali inert metals in periodic table, has an electronegativity value of 1.31. The greater the difference between electronegativities, the more polarized the bond becomes. The electrons in carbon-magnesium bond mostly belong to carbon, and carbon uses those electrons to act as both a strong nucleophile and a strong base. That's the behavior that characterizes organomagnesium regions or Grignard regions. In the previous slide, I said that a Grignard region is formed by the reaction of magnesium metal with an organic halide in ether solvents. The ether solvents is essential for Grignard region formation because, unlike, say, alcohols or dichloromethane, ethers will not react with Grignard regions. And more importantly, Grignard regions are well soluble in ethers. Ether supports the reaction, being a relatively polar but aprotic solvent. Magnesium is a divalent and electron deficient metal, and the ether stabilizes the Grignard reagent by releasing its lone pair electrons on oxygen to the magnesium. Protic solvents cannot be used to solubilize the material because the Grignard region, while being a great nucleophile, is highly basic. The reaction mechanism is still up in the air, although more than a century has passed since the discovery of the reaction. The mechanism has not completely been understood, yet it is certain that the first interaction occurs between the metal and the halogen atom. Besides, the overall reaction involves the insertion of magnesium into the new carbon-halogen bond, and this leads to a change in the oxidation state of magnesium from 0 to 2. A possible way of the mechanism starts with a free radical coupling of the magnesium to the halide X. This causes the formation of the alkyl radical R. Then the alkyl radical and the magnesium halide react to form the Grignard reagent. Another feature of the Grignard reaction is that the reaction takes place not in the solution, but on the surface of the metal. So the state of the surface plays a main role to determine how easily the reaction will start or proceed. The surface of magnesium is usually covered by a thin coating of magnesium oxide, which impedes the reaction with organohalide. That's why magnesium mostly requires initiation or surface treatment to allow the metal to come into contact with alkyl halide. The addition of iodine crystals is one of the methods used for this purpose, which is, at the same time, the method used in the experiment in question as well. Other than this, the oxide layer can also be broken up using ultrasound, using a stirring rod to scratch the oxidized layer off, grinding magnesium gently in a mortar with a pestle, or adding a few drops of 1,2-diiodoethane. Contrary to expectations, magnesium oxide does not react with any of these activators, either with iodine or with dibromethane. 
Activate is react with magnesium in those places where the magnesium oxide film has a small thickness or is defective. So the mechanical etching improves the activation. As a result, these places form cavities and are then filled with magnesium highlights. Green yard reagents vigorously react with water. Therefore, you cannot run the green yard reaction in any kind of glassware containing water. A highly exothermic proton transfer reaction occurs between water and the green yard reagent to produce an alkane and the magnesium halide hydroxide, which later decomposes into magnesium halide and magnesium hydroxide. Not only water, but also in the presence of any compound with suitably acidic hydrogen, such as alcohols, phenols, terminal acetylenes, carboxylic acids, and amines, the green yard reagents cannot be used. Although these green yard reagents react as if they are negatively charged carbonion, they are not really ionic. When dissolved in solution, precarbonion does not exist. However, the bond can still be treated as ionic due to the large electronegativity difference between carbon and magnesium. Therefore, it wouldn't be wrong to think of these reagents as negatively charged R donors. The formation of a new carbon-carbon bond is the key feature of the Grignard reaction. Grignard reagents are often used to add to aldehydes and ketones to make a new carbon-carbon bond which occurs between the R group of Grignard reagent and the carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde or ketone. Reacting a green yard reagent with an aldehyde gives a secondary alcohol while it brings about a tertiary alcohol with a ketone. The overall mechanism consists of two steps, nucleophilic attack and the proton transfer. The green yard reagent acts as a nucleophile and attacks the carbonyl group and then the resulting alkoxide ion is protonated to form an alcohol. Usually, a water workup step is needed to protonate the negatively charged oxygen of the formed alkoxide. Green yard reagents also react with est chlorides and esters. Unlike the way it reacts with aldehydes and ketones, two equivalents of green yard reagents are added to the ester to give a tertiary alcohol. After the first nucleophilic attack of green yard reagent to an ester, a new ketone is formed instead of an alkoxide. This ketone is subject to a second nucleophilic attack of another green yard reagent. After that, proton transfer occurs over the formed alkoxide. Reaction mechanism On this slide, I'll talk about the reaction mechanism of the experiment. First, we'll start off with making the green yard reagent. We will add bromobenzene to magnesium metal in the presence of dried diethyl ether solvent. In the first step, Magnesium metal inserts into the carbon bromine bond to give the green yard reagent phenyl magnesium bromide, which is both a strong base and a strong nucleophile. Here, we see a strong polarization due to the strong negative charge occurring on phenyl carbon and the partial positive charge developed on magnesium. Biphenyl impurity may accompany as the major impurity in this reaction each step. It will follow the product in the ether around until the end of the procedure. In the next step, trimethyl cyclohexanone is added. It has a partial positive charge on the carbon of the carbonyl, and the green yard region acts like a nucleophile attacking carbonyl carbon to give a new carbon carbon bond as shown here. This gives a magnesium alkoxide salt. Biphenyl product is carried along in the process as well. Then in step 3, Ice and aqueous ammonium chloride are added to protonate the alkoxide salt and give neutral alcohol. Ammonium chloride is a better proton donor than water and therefore aids in the protonation of the carbonyl oxygen after the green yard carbon group is added. At the end of the reaction, we get the product 1-phenyl-3-methyl-cyclohexanol as tertiary alcohol. Because this molecule has two chiral centers, based on the 2 to the power n rule, it must have four stereoisomers. Different combination of those four stereoisomers give two pairs of enantiomers and two pairs of diastomers. As seen in the picture, stereoisomer having SS configuration must have an enantiomer with an RR configuration. Likewise, an RS configuration matches with an enantiomer having a counter configuration of SR.
When it comes to the diastomers, one of these two chiral centers must have a common configuration, while the other one has an opposite configuration. Experimental procedure. Before moving on to experimental procedure, we should touch on some safety issues and challenges that we may face in this experiment. Diethyl ether is an extremely flammable chemical. It must be handled carefully. Bromobenzene is a toxic chemical. You must avoid breathing wafers and wear gloves when handling. Magnesium is a reactive metal and it gives off highly flammable hydrogen gas when it contacts acid. If you have leftover magnesium turnings at the end, you should not throw those in the regular waste jack. There is a special waste jack for magnesium. Water is very detrimental to this experiment until you purposely add it in the workup step. Do not wash any glassware to be used in the reaction with the water on the same day that the experiment is run. Do not handle anything that will contact the reaction mixture with your bare fingers to avoid your fingers moist material. Before starting setup, you must make sure all glassware is completely dry and there is nothing around that has the potential to cause any wetness accidentally. There are at least two ways to set up an addition and reflux, either by using a three-neck round bottom flask or a one-neck round bottom flask with a Claisen adapter. Depending on the idea of the less inlet of a closed system has, the more efficient the reaction will proceed, we'll pick the round bottom flask with one neck and the Claisen adapter attached to it. Start setting up by putting a magnetic stirrer in a 100 ml round bottom flask. Then insert a Claisen adapter into the flask. Connect the condenser to the side arm of Claisen adapter. If the side arm is not vertical, put the condenser on the vertical one. Every so often you may need to add a compound to a setup while reaction is going on, usually along with a reflux. You can use a separatory funnel as an addition funnel if it has a ground glass stem with a drip tip on the end. Place a separatory funnel directly above the round button flask. You wouldn't build up a vacuum inside the system because you'll put a drying tube on top of both the condenser and the separatory funnel. You won't need to use it, but just in case the joint of the drying tube does not fit with the joint of any of this glassware, you can use a thermometer adapter as bridging between them. And here we see the final view of the experimental setup. Since green yard regions are very strong bases and very sensitive to water and air, drying tubes are used in these organic reactions to prevent moisture from the air from entering a reaction flask. In this experiment, we'll use a calcium chloride drying tube. Calcium chloride is an economical and widely used drying agent with a high drying capacity. It is available in both powder and granular form. The granular form is often used in drying tubes. You start pegging a drying tube by placing a piece of glass wool into its bulb with the help of a stirring rod. The size of the glass wool must be as large as the bulb itself so that it fills all the space inside the bulb so we can make sure that the calcium chloride granules will not fall out of the tube. Then use a funnel to fill the tube with calcium chloride beds to a depth of a few centimeters. Complete it by stuffing another piece of glass wool into the tube to act as a stopper. Glass wool and drying agent must always be packed a little bit loosely because they provide a pad for release of pressure which can build up during a reaction. In other words, if they are packed so tightly that air cannot flow through them, they will seal the system and may cause an explosion. I want to draw your attention to the amount of chemicals we will use in this experiment. Even though we will follow the exact procedure, we will be using only 80% of the given amount of each chemical. To a 100 ml round bottle flask containing a magnetic steer bar, add 0.4 gram of magnesium turnings weighed on a watch glass and 0.8 gram of iodine crystals. Measure 4 ml dry diethyl ether right before adding it into the flask and make sure you tightly attach the lid of the container bag after removing the ether. Into a separate small size Erlenmeyer flask, prepare a solution of 1.84 ml or roughly 1.9 ml bromobenzene in 8 ml dry ether. Add this solution into the separatory funnel with a quick remove-attach move of the drying tube and drop wise on 
magnesium via the separatory funnel. This drop-wise addition step may take about 45 minutes. Do not turn on the water of the condenser yet, because moisture may condense on the inside of the condenser. After the yellow color disappears, the reaction starts. By the while, do not forget to keep the heater of the hot plate off. You'll only need to use its stirrer function. If you place a clean and dry crystallizing dish between the flask and the hot plate at the very beginning, you won't need to rush to place it there in case required. Instead, you can get a water bed ready very practically just by adding cold water prepared in a beaker beforehand into crystallizing dish. Some reactions will begin right away, and others may take up to the 5 to 10 minutes. If no reactions appear in after 10 minutes even though you added iodine crystal, first try to induce the reaction by swirling the flask. To accomplish the swirling easily, loosen the clamp and raise the apparatus setup as is at a height above that is not going to hit the crystallizing dish you place beforehand. Hold the neck of the round bottom flask, then push back and forth to steer. If this doesn't work, then warm the flask by holding it in your palms. Watch closely for signs of the reaction. Cloudiness, color change, bubbling at the surface of the metal, or a combination of the three are indicators that the reaction has begun. If all else fa fails, start another reaction using dry equipment. Once the reaction has started during the addition of bromobenzene solution, turn on the cooling water in the condenser and start the stirrer. At first, turn the water on very slowly and watch the rate of the flow. Water flowing should be kept at the minimum required level. Anything greater might run the risk of popping the water tubing out. Continue adding the remaining solution slowly to maintain a steady reflux. Too rapid addition might cause sudden rises in the temperature due to the exothermic characteristic of Grignard reaction, and this results in the formation of byproduct diphenyl besides causing the ether to boil. A possible vigorous boiling must be taken under control so that the condensation ring of the solvent remains in the lower third of the condenser. To do so, the reaction flask can be cooled by cold water, as explained before, but not to the extent that will stop the reaction. After all solution has been added, the reaction mixture must be stirred up for, for about 15 minutes. At the end of this period, if any magnesium is observed left as undissolved in the flask, reflux might be applied very gently. Finally, the flask is allowed to cool to room temperature before moving on to the next step. Measure 8 ml dry ether and 1.7 ml 3-methylcyclohexanone. Prepare a separate solution by mixing them in the smallest size of the Erlenmeyer flask. Transfer this solution into the separatory funnel. Make sure that stopcock is closed before you do it. Use the separatory funnel to add this solution slowly and dropwise into the reaction mixture. After the addition is completed, stir the mixture for 30 minutes. Then remove the reaction flask from the experiment setup. Protonate the product by adding crushed ice and 8 ml of 10% aqueous solution ammonium chloride subsequently. Transfer the whole mixture into a separatory funnel to separate the ether layer. After separating the ether layer, extract it with a 12 ml saturated solution of sodium bicarbonate. Repeat the extraction and separate the organic layer from the aqueous layer into a beaker one more time to dry it with sodium sulfate in the next step. Add only the required amount of sodium sulfate to dry the organic layer. Weigh a 50 ml round bottom flask and then filter the mixture into it by gravity filtration. You can use either a filter paper folded into a cone in a glass funnel to filter out the drying agent from the reaction solution or a wad of cotton loosely placed into the neck of the glass funnel. In the last step, Remove the excess solvent by rotor evaporation and weigh the mass of the product you got.